<laughs> you know, there is a good advice from, uh, from Gromov that any mathematical paper should have a title whose length should be less than nine words. So can, I, any, any, can you translate that? Fortunately, this is translated in a good language, French. <laughs> so as you can see, this title of this paper of Gauss is um, the general solution to represent a given surface on some other surface in such a way that in the small, this is a similarity. You can see below, in brackets, representation conform. This is not in the, in the German title, because the word conformal has been uh, invented by Gauss much later, in 1841. And the, French trans the guy who translated from German to French apologizes for this anachronism. And he uh, says that conformal is maybe shorter than sur une autre surface donnée de telle sorte que la représentation soit semblable à l'original dans les parties infiniment petites. <laughs> it's very uh, funny because this uh, French translation has been published in 1915 in the middle of the war, and the translator has to apologize for translating the work of a German mathematician. But he says that uh, uh, in order to be forgiven, he promised the translator that all the benefit from the translation will be given to the Association for War Widows, uh, whose, um, whose uh, uh, chief is Paul Appel. Okay, so uh, Gauss. Gauss, uh, uh, is he a probabilist? Is he a geometer? Is he an astronomer? We don't know. He's, he's probably one of the most important mathematicians of all times. As you probably know, many people have some kind of classification of who is the best, who is the second best, and this is nonsense, of course. But usually people say that among the three best mathematicians in history, there are Archimedes, Newton, and Gauss. Gauss is really fantastic. He did a lot of things. Algebra, we all know that of that. This wonderful Disquisition Arithmeticae when he was 21. Uh, this proof of complex fundamental theorem of algebra that was his PhD thesis uh, when he was uh, 19. Uh, his main contribution to celestial mechanics when he founded perturbation theory and uh, all these small denominators questions. Probability uh, for the normal distribution that the French used to call the Laplace distribution. Uh, uh, of course, in physics, uh, in magnetism, he invented uh, the telegraph. And he had a l major influence on geometry and geodesy with the Theorema Egregium, non Euclidean geometry, etc. He is really universal. In order to show you one example of his contribution, let me tell you the following. When he was born, I mean, his mother did, had forgotten the year of his, of his birth. So he didn't know when he was born. But his mother remembered that was on a Wednesday, and it was one week before the ascension, which is 40 days after Easter. So that was enough information for him to write a paper compute, computing the date of Easter. And this is one of his first papers. This is a great paper uh, trying to find some algorithm, how to compute the date of Easter as a function of the year. And so he could discover that he was indeed born in 1777. This, this, this paper is great. One, one of his great papers. OK. So uh, uh, today, I don't want to discuss everything. I want to discuss one paper, the paper they have, they have seen. This is a paper about cartography. In between 1821 and 1825, Gauss has been 
commissioned to draw the map of the kingdom of Hanover. You have to know that at the time, people knew that the Earth was not exactly a sphere. There was some kind of uh, uh, deformation from the sphere. And uh, uh, the, the French, in particular, had uh, uh, improved a lot cartography, but Gauss wanted to do better than the French. And he spent a long time, uh, at least four years, drawing the map of Hanover kin uh, Kingdom. Well, when I say drawing the map, that means that he was actually on the field. He was uh, riding a horse. He was trying to get money for the workers. It was a big, uh, uh, big, big work, which was not only theoretical, but it was also a work of, uh, of uh, practical uh, uh, things. In 1825, he wrote this paper that I will discuss today. And then uh, in, when he was riding a horse, he was thinking about the geometry of surfaces. He created the Theorem et Regium on the horse. He was doing all things at the same time. Getting money, riding horse, and thinking about curvature. And uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, 1828, he wrote this wonderful and famous book on the uh, geometry of curved surfaces, 1828, which is not the book I'm going to discuss today. And uh, uh, finally, in 1846, he wrote a big, big, big book on cartography full of computations, really pages and pages and pages of computations. I want to show you some. Oops. What happened? Oh, huh. Le Monde. OK, let me switch to tech instead of. Uh, what should I do? Should I compile? <laughs> okay. I don't know what's happening. Two, two. OK, so this is the map of the kingdom of Hanover. As you know, when you want to make a map, you need a triangulation. You have to choose some points, like uh, the top of a church or the top of a hill. And you have to measure all the angles between all these triangles. And then you measure by hand one of the sides of one of the triangles. And then you compute all the other sides using trigonometry. And he did that, and he published uh, a, a lot of Computations, he's one of the pages, of the thousand pages in his book on cartography. You have, uh, you know, computations of angles and length, etc., etc. He was a hard worker. Okay, so he was, at the same time, thinking about non-Euclidean geometry. He created non-Euclidean geometry. He did not publish it for philosophical reasons. He wrote somewhere that he did not want to publish non-Euclidean geometry because it was against the current state of philosophy at the time. He did not want to go against the opinion of Kant on the structure of space. So he did not publish it. But he was writing letters. He was writing letters to his friends, in particular to Schumacher. You have here a wonderful letter translated from German to French uh, from Gauss to Schumacher in which he says, look, 
Non-Euclidean geometry is not like Euclidean geometry. If you take a triangle, for example, it does not look like a triangle on the left, but more like on the, on the right. And if you go far away, the triangle looks like a Y. You know, he has this picture in mind, which was the starting picture for Gromov. I sent this letter to Gromov. He was amazed. I mean, Gauss had already understood that a hyperbolic space seen from far away looks like a tree. This is really amazing. So he was thinking about these questions on the back of the horse. OK, so let's go to this uh, paper. Uh, his question is this. You have the Earth, which may be not very spherical. We don't know. And on the Earth, you have a small country, which is the kingdom of Hanover. And what you want to do is you want to map it. And what is a map? Well, is a map, in the mathematical sense, to the plane. And uh, what do you want from this map? And that's the definition of conformal transformation, as we call it today. You want this map to be in such a way that the representation is similar to the original in the infinitesimally small, which means precisely that you want a differential of this map, which goes from the tangent plane here to the plane. You want the differential of this map to be a similarity, to be just a dilation. And the question is, does there exist such a map? Can you find a map which is conformal? And not only you want to prove that such a map exists, but you want to compute it. And when you want to compute it for the kingdom of Hanover, you don't want to prove an abstract theorem for an abstract country. You want to prove it for the kingdom of Hanover. And he does it. So he starts the paper by giving a proof that such a map exists. And then at the end of the paper, a formula for Hanover. So let us have a look at the theorem of, uh, of uh, Gauss as used today uh, uh, with words that we use today. The theorem is that any surface is locally flat, locally conformally flat. Any surface in space, you can map it locally, conformally to the flat space. This is the theorem of, of Gauss. And if you look at the proof, you see that Gauss is actually proving a theorem that I will express in this way, even though it's completely anachronic. He says every Riemannian surface is a Riemann surface. So what's a Riemannian surface? It's a surface equipped with a Riemannian metric. And the Riemann surface is a one-dimensional holomorphic curve. So every surface equipped with a Riemannian metric can be equipped with a structure of a complex one-dimensional manifold. And this is exactly what this theorem proves. This uh, paper of, uh, of Gauss proves exactly this, using, not using the words, but this is exactly what he does. Any surface is a complex manifold. So let me explain quickly how it does. So I will not go into the detail. This is, this is wonderful. This is easy to understand. May use, Gauss is not always easy to understand. But this paper, I don't know why. Maybe he wanted the, 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 the uh, I, would, I wanted to say the physicist to understand it. He, wa <laughs> <laughs> he wanted the, how, come on, the, uh, the map makers, I mean, the, yeah, the, the cartographers. He wanted the cartographers to understand it. The paper is, is written in a very uh, concise way, very easy to understand, at least the French version, because I did not read the English, the, Ameri the German version. So he explains. What is a conformal map? So he says the conformal map is a map which multiplies locally the, the metric by constant in the infinitesimally small. And then he tries to prove that there is one. Look, on this first line, you see that Gauss understood what a complex number is. We are in 18, I forgot, uh, uh, 1825. Uh, 
Gauss is writing the Cauchy-Riemann equation every page. He masters the complex analysis. He masters every, everything all our students know. This is amazing. So let me tell you what he does. He says, OK, let me take a local chart, which is not conformal, and uh, look at the, let me use modern terminology, look at the Riemannian metric in some coordinate system. To be conformal would be to make sure that the Riemannian metric has not this form, but the form n of xy dx plus dy squared. So the point is you look for a chart which is such that in some coordinate system, in this coordinate system, your Riemannian metric looks like that. So he writes this, uh, this Riemannian metric, and then he says, well, this is a second degree equation in dx dy. Let me factorize it in two linear factors. So he writes this as Of course he knows very well He knows very well that any equation of the second degree, some equations of the second degree do not have real solutions. But they all have complex solutions. So you can always split the Riemannian metric, which is a re real Riemannian metric. You can split it as a product of two linear elements, dp plus idq and dp minus idq, which are complex conjugate. And then he says, OK, now you just have a second uh, order equation here. You can split it in uh, P D pi. And then he is this way. He splits the equation is equal to 0, which makes no sense because it's a, it's a real, it's a definite positive quadratic form. So it has no zero, but on the complex uh, domain, it has two complex lines <coughs> on which the metric is zero. You have the Riemannian metric in x, y. It's that positive definite. Now you think of x and y are complex numbers, and you find two directions on which uh, the metric is zero. But these directions are complex imaginary. And then he says, OK, he says, I do that. I can uh, 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 p plus uh, I, I get the solution of my problem. I get the local uniformization for the Riemannian metric. Just if I can do that, I'm done. And he does that in many cases. And let me show you that. Oop. Then he says, let's do that on a special example. You take the ellipsoid of revolution. Then he writes the corresponding equation. He's not afraid with formulas. And finally, he gets the formula for the conformal transformation on the ellipsoid on the sphere. And then uh, I will not show you the details, but he shows the numerical value for the kingdom of Hanover. And then he finishes the problem proposé, et donc ainsi résolu, de manière générale et complète. He is cheating a little bit, uh, in particular, because he is dealing with um, analytic Riemannian metric and not with smooth uh, Riemannian metric. The proof of the local, conform the local, uh, conformal, the local uniformization theorem uh, uh, has been obtained in the C, infinity cat in the C1 category uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, and then you had the Alfors, Bears continuation, and all this story, that another story. But uh, this is a, a remarkable proof. OK, so now let me go to some. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is, this is, a, this is what it is. 
Yes, except that Beltrami was not, uh, Beltrami was uh, uh, 1870 or something. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to tell you about another paper by uh, uh, Pafnuti Chebyshev, strange first name, eh? Pafnuti, who wrote uh, uh, two papers on the same question. Uh, the first paper is called Sur la construction des cartes de géographie. And uh, this uh, paper is also remarkable. He says the following. You have a country on the sphere. You want to map it conformally in the plane. Of course, Chebyshev knows very well the paper of Gauss. He mentions it. And he says, OK, now we know there is a, there is, there is a map. But is there a map which is better than the others? Is there a map which will be more convenient for cartographer? Is it something more beautiful, which is better? And what would be better? Well, of course, we know that it's not possible that this map could not respect distances. But we have seen that this conformal map is a similarity at the infinitesimal level. Can we find a map which is as isometric as possible? So how can you measure the defect of isometry for such a map. So let me tell you, if you have a map from a country U on the sphere to the plane, which is conformal, you define a defect for that map that measures how much it is not an isometry in the following way. The distortion of the map is the ratio of the maximum value of derivative divided by minimum value of derivative. If this ratio is one, your map is, is perfect isometry because everywhere it's a, uh, is a perfect similarity. And you take the log in front of it in, in order to make it more beautiful. So the distortion of, of a conformal map is the log of maximal, dis maximal derivative divided by minimal derivative. And what you want to do is to find a map a conformal map whose distortion is as small as possible. And if possible, you want to make it to prove the existence of such a map. And if you can do it, to construct it in a concrete way. And the theorem of Chebyshev is this. Among all conformal representations of a given domain on the sphere into the plane, there is a unique one, up to similarity, which minimizes the distortion. Moreover, this unique map is characterized by the fact that the derivative on the boundary of the domain has a constant modulus. The, 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 the norm of derivative on the boundary of the domain is constant. So he gives a very explicit way of finding the best map. So I will, uh, yeah, I will try to prove that. That's not so hard. Uh, before I go on, let me uh, mention the plagia of the day. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'll tell you, OK. So this is a paper published in 1994 by uh, Feigenbaum, the famous Feigenbaum from Dynamical Systems, who unfortunately passed away last month. He gave a, a talk in 1993 on, the, on that. And then uh, I went to him after the talk and I told him, well, you did, we discovered uh, what Chebyshev did. And he said, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And the next year, he published this paper, which is exactly not word by word, but it's exactly the same content as the paper by Chebyshev. Well, it cannot be word by word because it's in English and Chebyshev is in French. <laughs> but this is amazing, once again. Why, why did he do that? 
What? How is it possible that you can publish something that you know very well, that has been published already a long time ago, and you might say, well, uh, the paper of Chebyshev is hard to find. You have to go to the library. Uh, you, uh, 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 the paper of Chebyshev is written in old-fashioned terminology. This is true. However, I will mention to you now another paper by, that I like very much by this young man. Who is this young man? Who? Jack Milner. Jack Milner. Yeah. So Jack Milner wrote a paper Maybe not his most famous paper, surely not his most famous paper, uh, uh, that I like very much and I want to discuss a little bit. The paper of Milner is this, A Problem in Cartography. And the paper of Milner is great. I want to tell you about this paper. And not only it is great, but it contains a few appendices and one of the most interesting appendix is a, a rewriting of Chebyshev with full citation of the original paper. Milner tried to understand the paper of Chebyshev. He did understand it, and he improved the proof, and he wrote a clear, crystal clear proof of it, of course, with full acknowledgment of uh, Chebyshev, and we are in 1969. So once again, uh, uh, we are not in 93. Huh? We are in 1969, and this uh, paper is easily available. OK, so uh, uh, let me give you a positive point with the paper of, uh, of, of Feigenbaum. Feigenbaum asked some computer scientists to find the best conformal maps for continents, like, for example, Africa. And here you have the best, uh, uh, the best possible conformal map for Africa, whose, um, whose distortion is about 2.1%, plus or minus, uh, the, the, the error in, in the scale is 2.1%. And as far as I understand, uh, the, classical, the classical maps of, of Africa are uh, 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 at least twice worse. Uh, you cannot find on classical atlases uh, uh, maps of the, of, uh, of the Africa with a, a defect which is just as good as that. I remember very well this talk of, um, of uh, Feigenbaum that was very interesting because he was explaining that in the world of cartographers, people are doing are usually improving the maps which have been produced by their fathers. So mistakes are just copied from generation to generation. And according to him, and I think he's completely right, cartography from time to time has to be completely renewed. Forget about the old atlases and do that from scratch again. And he suggested that we should follow his method, uh, Chebyshev's method, to find good maps, uh, 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 practical maps. OK. So what is the content of the papers of, uh, of, uh, of John Milner? I think this paper, nobody has read it, maybe except me, I don't know. But I like this paper very much because it's very elementary. You can ask a student to read it. It's, it's readable. It's, uh, it's full of interesting questions. And I like it very much. So here's the, the question of, of, of Milner. Forget about conformal maps and try to find maps which are as isometric as possible without being conformal. For example, you take a map from an open set in the sphere to the plane and you define the lower and upper scale, sigma 1 and sigma 2, to be the best constant, sigma 1 and sigma 2, such that the distance in the plane, oh, I made a mistake, x and y are in, in the sphere. So the, the two uh, uh, indices here should be s2. 
sigma 1 distance in, in the sphere between x and y is less than uh, distance of fx fy is less than sigma 2 distance in the sphere of xy. So you look for the best Lipschitz constant for the map and the best Lipschitz constant for the inverse of the map. And you are happy if sigma 2 is equal to sigma 1 because that would mean that the distances are just multiplied by sigma. And you'd call the distortion to be uh, the log of sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 and you want to make this, tor this distortion as small as possible. You want the map to be as isometric as possible. So let me mention two theorems of, uh, of, of, of Milner. The first one is an existent theorem. Given any domain in the sphere, there is a best map. There is a map whose distortion is the minimum possible. This is a theorem, but I'm pretty sure that most of you can prove it uh, in 10 minutes now, because you show, I'm surprised that Milner does not use the word Ascoli theorem. It's a consequence, it's an easy consequence of Ascoli theorem, it's not difficult. And then, in the second theorem, he takes an example. An example is, suppose that the country is a disk on the sphere. What is the best map how can you represent a disk on the sphere to the, to the plane in the best possible way? And he finds it. He finds the best possible map, and he proves that the best possible map is what geometers call the inverse of the exponential map. You take the tangent plane to the North Pole, and you map the lines going out of the origin to the meridians, and you respect the length along the, the, uh, along the lines. So this map is not conformal because it's isometric along the, ra the, the radii, but it's contracting a little bit the length along the, 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 the parallels. So the, the map is definitely not conformal, but uh, 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 Milner proves that this map, that, uh, uh, that cartographer called the orthomorphic map, the, this map is the best possible map. And then uh, uh, Milner comes with two wonderful questions which have, which have been sleeping since 1969. The two questions are dead. If you take a domain in the plane, this distortion minimum map which exists by the theorem, is it unique? up to similarity, of course. Is it smooth? I think nobody, I don't know if nobody proved it, but nobody tried to prove it. And the second conjecture is, um, if you take a domain in the plane, let's say in a hemisphere, in a sphere, pardon, and suppose it's convex, does there exist a map whose distortion is at most equal to the area of the domain as related to the to area of the sphere. For example, Milner gives an example of uh, United States of America. What is the area of the United States of America as compared with the area of the Earth? Harold. <laughs> Any hint? It's, it's a, I think it's an interesting number. 1.8%. United States of America is 1.8% of the Earth. <laughs> well, I think everybody, everybody should know that. It's a so small country. <laughs> uh, and so according to the conjecture of Milner, well, of course, the United States of America is not convex, but okay, assume it's convex. Uh, there should exist a map of America, of, of United States of America, uh, because this country is also in America. Uh, 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 there should exist a map whose defect should be less than 1.8%. And according to Milner, 
The best known map of the USA is, I think, 3%. So there is possibility of improving the accuracy of, of, of maps of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, America. Of course, today with Google Maps, etc., the question is not so important. But anyway, I think these questions are uh, 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 interesting. Okay. If you allow me, I try to prove the theorem of Chebyshev. Chebyshev says there's a unique map whose distortion is minimum, and this uh, minimum is characterized by the fact that on the boundary of the domain, the distortion is constant. Okay, let's try to prove that. Conformal, I come back to the conformal case. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, forget about this uh, potato and take a sphere. Even though you will see it's not important that this is an, a sphere. Take a country U and map it to the plane. And this is the sphere. So this map, F, and I, con I, I define, uh, let me call it G, let me say G of X to be the log of the modulus of derivative G. You see, G is a map from an open set in the sphere to an open set, open set in the plane. By assumption, it's conformal. So its derivative, its differential at each point, is a similarity. And this similarity has a size, and I take the log of this derivative. Okay? And the first question that uh, uh, Milner, says, uh, uh, Milner says in his description of Chebyshev is, what's special about this function g of x? g is a function from u to r log of derivative of a conformal map. And the observation of Milner is that the Laplacian of this function is equal to 1. The derivative, the log of the derivative of a conformal map from an open set on the sphere to an open set in the plane has a Laplacian equal to 1. What, does, what do I mean by Laplacian? Well, the sphere is a Riemannian manifold, has a Laplace operator, Laplace operator on the sphere. Well, to prove that, there is a beautiful formula uh, that I like very much. I used it many times in my, in my life. The formula is this. You take a Riemannian metric, in the plane, say it has a curvature k, and you multiply the metric by a function, sigma square gamma, where sigma is a function from the plane to r plus. So you rescale the metric by a function. And you want to compute the new curvature of the new metric after multiplication, multiplication by some conformal factor. And the formula is the following. The new curvature has been divided by sigma squared. The old curvature minus the Laplace operator of log sigma. This is a beautiful formula that is very useful to use. It's very useful in geometry. Now you hear the metric here as curvature plus one, the metric here as curvature zero. So you have a conformal transformation from plus one to zero curvature. Well, you use this formula. The new curvature is zero. The old curvature is one. 
So the Laplacian of the log of the conformal factor is equal to one. That's the proof of uh, this first assertion of Milner. The Laplace operator acted of the function G is one. In particular, this function G is subharmonic. Uh, it means that the maximum value of G is reached on the boundary of U. Okay. Now suppose that G on the boundary of U is equal to zero. That is, suppose that on the boundary, the scaling is constant, one, and the log of the scaling is zero. It implies, since the maximum uh, is reached on the boundary, that G has a supremum, which is non-positive. Now, what do we have to prove? We have to prove that any other map is not as good as G. We assume that the G is constant on the boundary, and we want to show that any other conformal map is not as good as G. So we have to define H of X to be equal to the log of the derivative of H. And the goal is to prove that the distortion of H is bigger than the distortion of G. So we have to prove, if I'm not mistaken, we have to prove that sup H minus inf H is bigger than sup G minus inf G. This is the distortion of the original map, and this is the distortion of some other map. And we have to prove that the new map is not as good as the first map. So I will prove it, but I need my notes, because each time I have inequalities, I go to analysis, and I'm out, you know, like a goldfish outside the bowl. I, mean, I don't know how to use inequalities. I need my paper. So uh, let me copy what I have on my, on my paper. Well, note that the difference h minus g is a harmonic function because both have Laplace and one. Now, let me consider the supremum of h minus g. Well, it's a supremum of a harmonic function. Therefore, it is reached on the boundary of u. So the supremum, I can write it as the limit of h of xi minus g of xi where xi is some sequence converging to the boundary because the, the, the supremum is achieved on the boundary. But I know that on the boundary, g is equal to zero. So this goes to zero so that this limit is less than the supremum of h. OK, so the supremum of, of h minus g is less than the supremum of h. So this means that h of x minus g of x is less than the supremum of h, which means if I take the infimum, this is analysis, huh? infimum of h minus g of x is less than supremum of h. This means that supremum of h, sorry, uh, this means that notes. Oh, yeah. Uh, supremum, yeah. H of x less than supremum of h plus g of x. I already wrote that. Inf h less than sup h plus inf g. Do not forget that the sup of g is equal to zero, so you get uh, sup 
h minus inf h greater than sup g, but inf of g is equal to 0, and I am done. My paper is done. So this is typical of Milner's papers. Uh, you read it, you understand every line is just perfect, and at the end of the proof, you cannot repeat it yourself. <laughs> OK, so I want to finish by mentioning another story, which is related to Gauss. Gauss was, nice, was not a nice man. I want to mention a theorem by Mr. Legendre. André-Marie Legendre he was a wonderful man, very modest, uh, who had uh, many, many, many competitions with Gauss. And always Gauss was um, treating him as being an inferior. And Gauss was really nasty with, with uh, Legendre. In particular, for example, the least square method in statistics has been clearly invented by Legendre, but Gauss never accepted it. But Le Legendre did not care too much. He was very modest. And on a proof, as a proof of his modesty, let me explain the following story. This is the portrait of, uh, of Legendre, which has been known for 200 years. And to, during 200 years, it was the only portrait of Legendre which was known. Except that, quite recently, somebody discovered that this Mr. Legendre is indeed Mr. Legendre, but not the right one. <laughs> this Mr. Legendre was a butcher. He was a, a very influential man during the French Revolution, but he is not a mathematician. And uh, then, all of a sudden, this portrait became useless, and nobody knew how Legendre looked like. And uh, 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 a few years later, in the, uh, in the uh, somebody found in the archives of the Académie des Sciences some caricature, caricature? caricatures of famous academicians, uh, Fourier and Legendre. So that today we have only one portrait of Legendre, which is the following. Legendre, uh, once again, was a very nice man. Uh, uh, not physically. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you uh, 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 a story that I think is interesting from this point of view. Legendre spent his life developing the theory of elliptic functions. He wrote three or four volumes on elliptic functions. But he never had the idea that elliptic functions would be much better understood if you look at them not as multi-valued functions, but as periodic functions. And when he was 75, he received a letter from a young man from Germany, Jacobi. And Jacobi wrote a letter, a very modest letter, saying, Professor Legendre, I think it would be much better to look at elliptic functions the other way around, as periodic functions instead of multi-valued functions. And uh, uh, the answer of, of, uh, of Legendre is really fantastic. I mean, he immediately, the same day, he sends a letter to this young man, who is, I think, 19 or 20 at most, uh, uh, congratulating him. He writes something, I'm running to the Académie des Sciences to explain your idea, and I'm changing my fifth volume of, of the, of, on, on elliptic function. He was so happy. And to help this young man, and began a long exchange of letters. They never met. They never met. But they exchanged a long series of letters uh, that you can find on the collected papers of Jacobi in French. Uh, this is really fantastic. I mean, this old Legendre is trying to help the young Jacobi. And for example, in one letter, Jacobi says, well, I got a position in, ja in Göttingen. I want to thank you. And uh, at the end, the most interesting letter is the last letter. But you should not read it. Uh, uh, Le Jean gives advice for choosing his wife. <laughs> uh, do not have a look at this letter. 
Anyway, so let me mention a theorem of Legendre. And once a, I think it's a beautiful theorem that almost no geometers know. And uh, this theorem of Legendre immediately uh, uh, has been uh, reproved by Gauss. And Gauss was a genius. The long proof of Legendre, I think 15 or 20 pages of computations, has been replaced by one page of Gauss. And here's a theorem that I want to show you now. It's a very uh, uh, interesting, interesting uh, theorem. When you measure angle, when you are a cartographer, you are on top of a mountain. You measure uh, uh, angles using a theodolite, the not a telescope, theodol theodolite. Theodolite, theodolite. Uh, a telescope, you look at the stars. Huh? Uh, you use uh, this kind of telescope. And you look at these angles. But these angles are not the angles on the sphere. They are angles in Euclidean geometry of the Euclidean triangle formed at the three vertices that you look at. And when you construct your map, you want to compute the spherical angles. When you, your map, you want to know the, 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 the spherical angles. Now, if you take a, a, a triangle, let's say on the right, uh, uh, Euclidean, uh, uh, triangle with angle alpha prime, beta prime, gamma prime. As you all know, in Euclidean geometry, the sum of the three angles is equal to pi. But in spherical geometry, the sum of the three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, is equal to pi plus the, er plus the area of the, of the triangle. This is the girard gauss bonnet theorem. Okay. Now, uh, what Legendre did is the following. He says, suppose you have two triangles. One is spherical, and the other one is Euclidean. And suppose these two triangles have the same length of the, of the sides. They have the same length for the three sides. Of course, they do not have the same angles, because as you can see, alpha prime, beta prime, gamma prime will sum up to pi, and alpha beta gamma sum up to, to pi plus area. So alpha prime, beta prime, gamma prime are bigger than alpha, beta, gamma. And the theorem of Legendre is that each one of the angles alpha, beta, gamma is equal to each one of the corresponding uh, Euclidean angle plus one third of the area. Up to a mistake of the fourth order in the area of the triangle. So if you know the angles in the, Eucle in the Euclidean triangle, you can easily compute the angles of the corresponding spherical triangle just by adding one third of this excess of the triangle. And this theorem is uh, very useful if you look, for example, in Google or whatever. You don't find that uh, in the reference for mathematicians, but for cartographers. Cartographers use that every day. They add one third of the area uh, to, to, to fix the, the value of the angles. And the error is of the order of the fourth power of the, of the, of the, area, of the, of the, of the area of the triangle. And in practice, a triangle that you measure on cartography is at most 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers. So the fourth power of the area is just negligible. So this theorem. Uh, I think is uh, wonderful. It's always it's also true in hyperbolic geometry, actually. And um, it's very useful in, in practice. What's funny with this theorem is that it's OK with any triangle independently of its shape. It could be very thin. One of the angles might be very small. But nevertheless, if one angle is very small, nevertheless, it will carry one third of the excess independently of the shape of the triangle. OK, so uh, uh, like Le, Le Genre proved this. He wrote this long paper. Uh, I, I could not understand it. And then uh, Gauss uh, published a one-page paper, uh, 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 which is elementary of Leitung, blah, blah, in which he gives a full proof of Le Genre in one page. Uh, this is like um, humiliation for the French. Uh, I, I'm finished now. I just want to say that. Uh, in another paper of Gauss, Gauss was not satisfied with this fourth power of the area. 
So he continued the development in successive powers of the area, and he wrote a wonderful formula for the alpha prime is equal to alpha plus one third of the area plus one over 188 uh, in a very beautiful series, uh, giving better and better approximations for these angles, but it's totally useless in practice for cartographers. Thank you very much. <laughs>